מהכלכלנים ההתנהגותיים הבכירים בעולם. המחקר פורץ הדרך של פרופסור שלמה בן ארצי מ-UCLA, Anderson School of Management וריצ'רד טלו מאוניברסיטת שיקגו, הצליח להכפיל את תוכניות החיסכון של ארבעה מיליון אנשים בעולם. הוא רוצה להשתמש בטכנולוגיה כדי לעזור למיליארד אנשים. הוא כלכלן מוביל ומומחה עולמי בקבלת החלטות, ולמרות זאת, הוא קיבל החלטה רגשית למדי, שהוא החליט לטוס 16 שעות מלוס אנג'לס לישראל כדי להופיע מולכם היום. הוא רצה להופיע בהבימה, כי הוא נולד וגדל בישראל. הוא זכר משום מה שהיה ילד, ההורים שלו היו לוקחים אותו להבימה לראות את הפסטיבל. שלומי בן ארצי, אני שמחה להזמין אותך לבמה. בימת הפסטיבל כולה שלך. תודה, קרן, תודה. יש רק בעיה אחת, אחרי שהסכמתי לבוא להרצאה גיליתי שהפסטיגל אף פעם לא היה בבימה, אלא בהיכל התרבות, אבל אני חושב שזה מאוד קשור להרצאה שלי, שאנחנו לא מקבלים החלטות באופן מאוד רציונלי. היום אני רוצה לדבר על הדיג'יטל מיינד, בעיקר על איך אנשים מחליטים על מסכים. מסכים גדולים, מסכים קטנים, ובעיקר איך הם מחליטים באופן מאוד שונה על, על מסכים. אני חושב שזה יהיה מאוד חשוב אם אנחנו רוצים לעזור לאנשים להחליט יותר טוב. <coughs> אני אעבור בין אנגלית לעברית, כי אין לי מושג האמת היא מבחינה מקצועית בכלל איך לדבר בעברית. אולי צריך לתקן את זה, לחזור לארץ, אבל בכל מקרה. So I'm going to talk about behavioral economics. For those who don't know much about it, um, this is for people like me, who don't really know economics, who don't really know psychology, know a little bit of each, you put it together, it's really powerful. So what was behavioral economics? before we move to the 2.0. So in the old days, we virtually um, ran around as behavioral economists and studied the mistakes people make with their money. And, um, you know, we would run around and say people are really dumb, they take a huge mortgage, and then they can't pay it, and then you get what happened in the U.S. where everyone forecloses. Then we would run around and say, look at the people who buy lottery tickets. Turns out, if you look at the bottom two deciles of the population in the US, they spend a lot more money on lottery tickets than they do saving for retirement. So every month, they put a lot more money into lottery tickets. The average household in Singapore spends $4,000 a year on lottery tickets. Um, and then we would say people don't save enough. Uh, the saving rates in the U.S., depending when you measure it, is about zero. There was only one problem with that, that it didn't help anyone to have some economist learn a bit of psychology and run around and say everyone is an idiot. Nobody can figure out how to handle their finances. And that's really where behavioral economics 2.0 came, where the idea is, instead of just understanding the mistakes people make with their money, it's really about making a difference. What can we do to create solutions? So that was back in the mid-90s, before iPhones, and, and roughly before emails. Um, Academics have been using emails since the early 80s, uh, but by and large, you know, it was a world that was very different. And the tasks that we had, me and Richard Taylor, was to help people with self-control issues. So the first area we thought we'll try and address was obviously obesity. But that turned out to be really difficult. So, uh, you know, we failed, uh, both me and, and Richard. 
So we figured out, let's figure out another problem of self-control, um, which would be a lot easier to solve, and that happened to be with savings. And as you'll see, it's actually relatively easy. And the reason is you have one employer and one financial institution. And if you could have them on board, you could design really cool solutions. So we actually took people who made little money, it was actually in the Midwest, in the US, manufacturing company, and we started to chat with people. And the first thing was, do you want to save more? And everyone said, of course. So we said, okay, why don't you save more? They say, you're an idiot. You don't understand anything. We say, what? They say, we can't even pay the rent. What are you talking about saving more? So we came with a program that tried to address it. It had a lot of psychology behind the scenes. I want to get to talk about the digital world, so I'm not going to go into too much details. But it was a very intuitive uh, program. We told everyone, if you want to save more, you don't have to do it today. This is a program where you could keep spending today. But how about you save more tomorrow? And people found that appealing. It's very much like our diet plans and our exercise plans. How many of you had a plan starting 2015, you'll do something differently? Anyone? Right? Keep your hands up. How many of you have followed up on your plans? Not many, right? So there's something that makes it really easy to think that in the future we'll do the right things. It's something that we call present bias, but it doesn't matter the fancy terms. Um, it's very effective. We had another trick. We didn't want people to change their mind. So we told them to save more when they make more money. Every time they get the pay raise, they're going to end up saving more. You never, ever have to cut your spending. And we put that to test. Um, we were really shocked. You know, life is full of disappointments. Those of you in the startup area probably know that better than anyone else. Uh, but once in a while, you get a good surprise. And that was one of those moments where uh, about three and a half years after we started the experiment, uh, we got a call from someone we worked with and said, here's the Excel spreadsheet. That was a long night. I looked at the data. We found that people quadrupled their saving rates. Within three and a half years, they went from virtually saving nothing to 13.6% almost everyone at the company joined the program. So we were really excited. Fast forward, by 2011, four million Americans doubled their saving rates, and I would actually be the first one to admit that as wonderful an experience this was, and successful, and probably to date, the only um, behavioral economics experiment done that affected millions of people as opposed to hundreds or thousands, I would actually be the first one to argue that we failed miserably. This is actually a disaster as much as I'm concerned for two reasons. One, it took 15 years. How many of you have the patience with your startup to wait 15 years for big success? Anyone? Right? Life is too short. So what is this idea of waiting 15 years to do something? And second, yes, we help 4 million people, but if you look at the US alone, probably about 100 million are saving too little. So we affected 4% of the target audience. So, you know, it was a nice start, but I actually view it as... Um, is really disaster. And, and that really, seriously, right? Well, I'm ambitious, you know. Um, anyway, so that really brings me to what you might think of behavioral economics 2.1, which is kind of online behavioral economics. And the goal is very simple. If it took us 15 years to affect 4 million people, 
We want larger, we want bigger impact, and we want it to be faster. Now, that was not possible in the mid-90s. I mean, these are the old days. I mean, the systems, from a technology perspective, that you had to deal with, the systems were so inflexible that you couldn't get anything done. I think, if you think about technology, we could do it all today, bigger scale, far greater um, speed. But there's a little problem, you know, because you might ask, well, why wouldn't you and your buddies, Shlomi, go to Silicon Valley, hire a few kids, yet better, outsource it to Israel, and, you know, change the world? And, and the problem I realized when I started to think about the online world is that we think very differently sometimes. Not always, but sometimes we think very differently. And if we don't understand those differences, we can't identify the opportunities then we're actually not going to drive the behavior changes. There could be areas where actually the technology would backfire if you don't understand uh, the intersection of technology and psychology. So I want to talk about four differences between online and offline. The first one is where we know something about human nature, and for some reason it evaporates on screens, Oh, it just gets a bit weaker. And before I do that, I want to give you um, a quick background about behavioral economics. The number one lesson we've ever had in behavioral economics is change the default option. You want people to donate body organs, God forbid something bad happens to them, make it the default. People can opt out but make it the default. You want people to save more for retirement? Make it the default, they can opt out, but nobody would bother to. So that's kind of the number one lesson we've had, that if you change the default, you would actually be able to change poorly the behavior of 70, 80% of people, and everyone can still opt out. So keep that in mind. What I'd like to do now, I want you, to help me save lives, but unlike my organ donation example, we're going to do it on screens, because a lot of choices are now down on some digital display. So this is the UK, National Health Services. God forbid you need a surgery, not an emergency one, let's say knee replacement, and you go to a website, and that's where you actually pick the hospital. You get a lot of data. You get a lot of hospitals. I've made it easier, just three. And for each hospital, you get a lot of data. For example, how likely are you to die during the surgery? And you could see that there's some numbers, which are some indices, and you could see in this case that the best hospital is W. And we designed it deliberately that way, that hospital W is the best. You're not going to die, you're not going to have to run back to the hospital, you're going to feel better, but to have some trade-offs, it's a bit further away. Now think about it for a moment. Tens of millions of people using this website to decide whether they're going to the hospital that would be more likely to kill them or more likely to treat them. Okay? And we need now to design it in a way that would make people go to Hospital W. The British government would like that because you will treat people, they're not going to die, and you're going to create competition so that the other hospitals have to get better because they'll notice everyone going to W. Okay? So let's look for some volunteers. Yaron, thank you so much for volunteering. Um, how would you design the screen? What would you do to encourage people to go to Hospital W? Uh, no uh, 
Okay, so Yaron has an idea. Maybe we'll provide them with information on, of the quality of that hospital. Um, unfortunately, in this world, nobody bothers to read anymore. You know, that's like something that is out of flavor. There's a lot of information on the website. There's a lot of hospitals. You get like 100 measures on each. So it's really tough for people. So let's find another um, volunteer. Um, I've got here Vered. Vered, what would you do? How would you encourage them to go to W? How are you going to change the display? So we're going to create an app um, that's going to help us get there. Maybe it's available on our smartphones. We'll talk about that later. We can actually debate, should we allow people to choose an hospital on an iPhone? How many of you feel it's a good idea if it's got a web version, we should do an iPhone app and they should pick it? How many feel it's a really bad idea to let people make decisions on iPhones? I do. I'm going to actually show you some data later that people actually are stupid on iPhones. The same questions they can answer on a big screen, they might suddenly not know the answer on a small screen. Because that's a screen that we play with Tinder. We just flipped photos quickly. It's no longer a screen that we used to really think. So I don't know if we really want people to be multitasking and make serious decisions on a little screen. We can debate that. OK, one last suggestion. Anyone else has a suggestion what we're going to do to this display to encourage people to pick W? Yes, please. Make it more graphic. How would we do that? OK, so maybe we should convert um, all of those numbers into some visuals with colors so we'll know what's good, what's bad. Um, definitely uh, a sensible idea. People don't spend a lot of time on those screens. So let me tell you what I wanted you to tell me. Set the default, exactly. So I wanted you to tell me, let's change the default. Let's actually click W. And if they don't like it, they can opt out. That's the number one lesson we've had. We always thought it works. In every experiment ever done, it worked until we tested it on online. So in one of the conditions, <coughs> Barbara and Elena have been doing this study, clicked W, and everyone opts out. Some segments of the population, it actually backfires. You pick the safe hospital, everyone goes to the other one. Now, I can't tell you that we fully understand it and why it happens. We need a lot more research, but think about it for a second. You spent all the time learning about behavioral economics. You took the number one lesson that was bulletproof. You apply it, and everyone goes to the worst hospital. So we really have to start understanding how people make decisions on screens before we could really design them in a smarter way to help them. OK. Um, there are some tendencies as you would expect, that would get a lot stronger on screens. And you wouldn't be surprised that uh, they probably fall in a category of visual biases. It's a visual device. If you tend to look at it very quickly, most likely visual biases would be a big thing. How many of you knew that people are a lot more likely to look in the middle of the screen? No, you should know it. OK, you're not doing enough A-B testing. 85% um, of the top 10,000 websites in the world, these are big websites, do no A-B testing at all, none. 
So we need a lot more learning even within our community. So what to me is shocking, this is what happens if you do eye tracking, you check where people look. If you have a three by three metric with data, people look in the middle most of the time. Those numbers are out of 25. But what's shocking is not that they have this bias towards the middle, it's just how powerful it is. Think about it, 99% of the first place people looked was in the middle, and everything else is virtually zero. Now also what's interesting, that in this experiment, they gave people a choice of snacks for food, they first asked them whether they like chocolates, bananas, whatever. And then they trick them. They put the items they don't like in the middle. 60% of the people suddenly picked the items they said they do not want because it's in the middle of the screen. So this is scary, but it's also an opportunity. If you think about the way Amazon places things on the screen, they don't factor it in. Maybe they should. Now what's interesting, those visual biases depend on the context. So if you have a two by two metric, there's no middle, so the bias is not as strong, but half the people will first look at the top left corner. This is done for those in the US, English as their main language. If you were to do it in Israel, I would suspect you're gonna get the top right corner. So we need to keep thinking about the culture and hopefully automatically personalize everything. Okay? So this might now seem like, like something that applies to you know, selling stuff online, but I want you to think for a, for a second about the implications of that, even in the last summer, where terrorists going underneath the border, through the tunnels, and popping up on the Israeli side. It's no longer, no longer the case that, that wars and, and things are, are, are done the old ways. It's all on computer screens. We get some pictures from the drones. They go to some bunker in the Kirya. Someone looks at them. And that's virtually how we do all of that nowadays. So now think about it. Suppose that the terrorists accidentally show up on the screen in the bottom right corner, and you have the most dedicated analyst sitting there, and she or he might just not see the terrorists. So now you might say, okay, what's the solution? If you know that, if you know that we have cold spots, not just hot spots, but cold spots, you might say, well, let's put more analysts so we're gonna be able to see each part of the screen. That actually backfires. The more people you put, the more you divide the screen, the more cold spots you have. It's not a problem of zooming in. You want to avoid the edges. You want to put them in the middle so we'll see them. You actually want to zoom out. So there's a lot of actually counterintuitive solutions when you start thinking about it. How many of you are in the, um, in the health domain? Anyone? One? Not many. Um, you take radiologists, you put a man, in a gorilla suit, on the screen, in the top right corner, 50 times larger than cancer cells they should actually find on the screen, they don't see it. They actually don't know that on the x-ray film they looked on the screen, where there was a huge man in a gorilla suit, in a cold spot, that he was there. So now you have to start thinking how you position the different parts of the body on the screen to ensure that we're not gonna miss cancer. So these are important. 
Okay, I want to, um, to do a little exercise that that's, um, might be devastating for those who work on designing websites. Um, let, me, let me look for another volunteer. Thank you so much. Can I have you come to the stage, please? And we're going to do a little exercise together. If the technology would work, by the way, nothing works with me. What's your name? Roy. Roy, name of Shlomi. Roy. Um, <clears throat> Roy, we're going to look at some websites soon. There are going to be three of them. They might show up really fast or a little slower or really slow. If they show up really fast, that's okay. That's what I want you to look at, and then I'm going to ask you how pretty they are. If you think about the visual appeal, really ugly, one. If they're really great, beautiful, we'll give them a nine. Okay? Let's start. So this is going to play soon. It takes a few seconds to start, and then we're going to see the first, if it's going to work, nothing works when I'm on the stage, if it's going to work, we're going to see, actually, soon, the first website. How beautiful do you think it was, from one to nine? Three. We'll see another one soon. What do you think? Three, okay. One more. Yeah, what do you think this time? You got to see it finally. What do you think? How be beautiful is it? Three. Excellent. Thank you, Roy. Um, okay. So think about it for a moment. Roy saw it for 50 milliseconds. He didn't really see it the first time. That's one second divided into 20. He made a judgment. It's the same judgment when he gets to see it for half a second or five seconds. And it's not just Roy. He evaluated the website in 50 milliseconds. Before he was able to read anything, where he was only able to remember a bit of color, Crowley noticed there was some red color, and not much more. And he was able probably to see how crowded the page was. In 50 milliseconds, people decide how much they like the website, whether it's usable, and whether they should trust it. This is all you have to impress your clients, 50 milliseconds. All the beautiful designs that get awards <laughs> don't score well when you test them with people. <laughs> Because you pay too much attention to the details nobody cares about in those 50 milliseconds. There are models out there that can actually predict how men versus women, young, all Israelis, Americans, react to different color palettes and complexity. And that's virtually the only thing that determines most of the trust that your website will get. So think about how bizarre uh, that is. Okay, let's see if I can... Uh... Oh, perfect. Um, there are all sorts of behavioral tendencies that are very unique to screens. We're not familiar with them from other domains. One of them is that screens don't judge us. They're anonymous. You could talk at them, they don't talk back at you yet. Now, that means that's probably a bigger problem in the US and it used in the Israel than it used to be, but probably not as big as the UK, Australia, or the US, which is drinking. Um, so in those studies, we're gonna skip some of the details, but the, the bottom line is if the doctor asks you, how much you drink, you're likely to lie. If he gives you an iPad in the waiting room, 
so you have something to do while you're waiting, you're a lot more likely to tell the truth, even though you know that he's going to get to see the results in two minutes. So think about that. <laughs> These anonymous screens might be a wonderful device to learn some things that people are more comfortable telling a device. <clears throat> it could literally save lives. How many of you have uh, teenager boys, girls in the... Okay. So I have a friend um, who has a teenager girl and she, she tried to commit suicide. Almost. She didn't tell her parents anything. She didn't tell her friends anything. She didn't mind posting it online that she's planning to commit suicide on her dad's 45th birthday. And this is how she's going to do it with all the details. Now, she knew that her friends will see it. She knew that they're going to tell the parents. And she obviously wanted help. She didn't really, hopefully, want to commit suicide. But those anonymous screens literally saved her life because she wouldn't talk to people about it, but she wouldn't mind posting it. So everyone, ironically, um, can see it. Now, that's the good thing. It does come with some side effects, which is <clears throat> when you start thinking about these new devices and how they affect behavior, it could be great, it could be horrible. What do you think happens when we order food online? We order more calories than ever before. So the restaurants that move to um, iPad screens, people actually order a lot more calories than before. So if you eat online, you actually get fat. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk next, and I'm soon going to run out of time before I break the stage. Um, <coughs> I want to talk about all sorts of behavioral lessons we've had that were very difficult to implement. But now with technology, we've known about them for a while, but we can finally really use them. And I'm going to talk actually about showing people how they're going to look in the future. Giving you a picture, a digital picture of how you're going to age. We've known for a while that people don't connect with their future self. It's, it's like a stranger. If you put the brain inside the MRI machines and you do some scans, you can actually find that the part of the brain that is activated when you think about your future self is the exact same part as thinking about strangers. There's an empathy gap. It's easy to close it if you take pictures of people and you show them how they're going to look. So we're going to do that next. I'm going to show you an experiment that was done where you show people their future self. The slider is how much you save. If you're going to save more, the future self starts smiling. The current self is less happy. Showing people that makes them actually save more. Now think about what could be done if you combine that with personalization techniques and videos that are more concrete and more dynamic. So look for a second at this video. Hola, Francisco Javier. ¿Sabes quién soy? Me conoces muy bien porque soy tú, pero dentro de 30 años. Te envío este mensaje desde 2044 porque quiero agradecerte que pensaras en mí. Mejor dicho, que estés pensando en mí en 2014. Y lo envío para ayudarte a tomar la decisión correcta que me ha permitido vivir más cómodamente desde la jubilación. Como ya has hecho una aportación a tus planes... So I'm going to skip some of the details because I'm running out of time. But think about it. If we can merge that technology done by Aidomu, Danny Kalish is here, he's going to chat later, but you virtually personalize the videos. 
each person gets his own video. If you can actually show people the future self inside a video, how powerful the combination of the visuals, closing the empathy gap and personalization can be. And nowadays, you know, it's all with a click. So we talked about differences. The fact that some of our most basic lessons from behavioral economics might sometimes be a bit weaker on screens. Some might be stronger. Some might be new. And if you think about what you're trying to do, you're trying to take that toolbox of behavioral economics and pick the right ingredients so you're going to create the right solution. So you need to know what works and what doesn't work online. You need to know what works on different types of screens. I learned some financial literacy questions. People cannot answer it on an iPhone. You give them a bigger screen, they suddenly can actually answer it. So it raises a lot of questions about the decisions. We may or may not want people to answer on different devices. I'm running out of time. I want to just show one slide, and then I'm going to wrap. And this is a little experiment we did with personal capital. It's one of those robo-advisors um, in uh, Silicon Valley. We had a little trick where we can actually um, randomize almost when people put an app on their phone that when they go to the mall and they do some shopping, they get to see how much they spend relative to their goal that month. They reduce their spending by 15 percentage points. Think about how powerful that is for a moment. They download an app, that's a click. Everything happens after it automatically. They're spending 15% less of their income. They might be saving 15% of their income like this. You can't get that with, with anything else. The scale and the speed is just unreal. I'm going to skip everything else because we're running out of time. And just to summarize, <clears throat> where I started, I think that if we get smarter screens, if we learn how to really design them for the way people think in 2015, we could really create huge, large, and fast behavioral changes, whether it's obesity, whether it's teaching kids. By the way, people don't learn well on screens. Studies after studies after studies show that people learn a lot more with pen and paper. But we also know how to fix it. And I see that people are coming to kick me out. So my last point would be, if you think about investing in understanding human behavior, it's probably the lowest hanging fruit to drive huge behavioral change. So thank you very much. Thank you.